everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Novel Tea Podcast. My name is Alexandra. And I'm Emily. And we're here drinking tea. What do you have today? I am doing uh, Twining's Darjeeling. I am doing Tea of Republic Earl Grey. We're having some English tea today. It's English black tea it's day here. It's English black tea. We need a little kick, a little, little caffeine. A little honey in both of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, a very classic cup of tea. Exactly. This is... This is how you do afternoon tea. Yeah. And so for today, we have a bit of a special episode. Emily is going to be traveling all of the month of March, basically. Yes. Where are you going? I'm going to New Zealand. Um, I'm I, <laughs> so excited. It's kind of one of those things that we planned like nine months ago, and all of a sudden it was like, wait, that's next month. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's here. <laughs> the thing we've been waiting for. I messaged her and I was like, um, we're going to be gone all next month. <laughs> yeah. So for our episode that we would normally do we're going to do a little bit of a quick one and we're going to do rapid fire q a back and forth on uh book questions for each other it's just a bit of a filler episode for you guys but hopefully you enjoy it anyway have some fun here today yeah so we're going to just jump right in you ready let's do it okay what are you reading right now i actually started this morning Anne Rice's uh the wolf gift Uh uh-huh and i'm only i'm doing it in audio i'm only like two hours in and i am also like all in like the the atmosphere is perfect it does start out in the state that i live in Mm -hmm. that we live in (laughs) obviously and i don't know there's always something to me about like when a book starts out in like my Mm -hmm. home i'm like oh i'm immediately attached to this and you know we have a pretty strong culture here we live in california we'll just say that okay we live in the state of you can't find us based on that. It's a big state. It's a big state, people. I mean, you probably could find us anyway. But Let's it's not, not a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, but we do live in California. And of course, I I was just talking about this with a coworker of mine. Like, I kind of, I like being Californian. I like California yeah. culture. There's I a lot like, of things to like about it. We have a lot of good food. It's very diverse here. Yeah. So I like our people, you know. The atmosphere, it opens up on the California coastline, which is my favorite part of California is the coast. And it's just like, oh. Yep. I'm I'm in just for that, but then they start getting into the plot, and there's like archaeology and like mysteries, and I'm just like, yep, yeah. I will be doing this today. Fantastic. <laughs> How about you? I'm reading two books. On audio, I'm listening to a book called The Midwitch Cuckoos, which is a sort of weird sci-fi. Actually, I think you might like it. Ooh. It's set in England. There's a... Well, and I'll just tell the opening event, because that's not really a spoiler. That's back of book matter. So you have a couple is driving back home to Midwich and they're like, there's like police blocking them off and they're like, the whole town's shut down. You can't get in. And they're like, oh, okay. And then they decide to just like hoof it across some fields to get home because they're trying to get home. And there is apparently just this mysterious, perfectly circular barrier around the city. And the minute you cross it, you pass out. And everybody in the town has passed out all the cows, all the animals, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of like the mystery that kicks it off. And Interesting. So, so a little annihilation going on. Exactly. A bit of an annihilation barrier thing. Exactly. It's not as weird as annihilation. <laughs> not even close yet. <laughs> very few things are. Yeah. But so far I'm enjoying it and it's very british and Yes. Nice. Okay. This does sound like a yeah. nice flavor. Yeah. And then um, physically I am reading The Hundred Years Conflict in Palestine for topical reasons. I've realized my understanding of history in that region is definitely lacking. So we're doing some self-education with some recommended books that I I found online. I actually forgot to read. I am also reading a physical book. Whoa, 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 I know, right? Stop the presses, everybody. So I like should mention that because I'm doing this thing. I'm reading House of Leaves. Oh, um, And it was kind of the type of, it's a gigantic book. It's a very complicated book. It's in essence like three books in one mm-hmm. and they're all written like almost concurrently. Yeah. Um, and I told myself, I'm going to finish this before we go to New Zealand. And right now I'm in the mode of like, I'm going to finish this before 2025. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being very realistic about this right now. We've adjusted our expectations. Indeed. Yeah. But it's like, it's so weird because it's in essence a haunted house story, mm-hmm. but the level of complexity that's like, it's hard to explain past that. It's like a lot mm. of like, it's very much like a found footage type story mm. where where like a character finds a bunch of documentation in the chest. I love that. Yeah, so you're reading it's the like doc- a Nathaniel Hawthorne right, classic right. maneuver. Exactly. So you're reading the documentation in the chest 
while you're also reading the story of the guy who found the mm-hmm. documentation, they're like running side by side, mm-hmm. and then there are like a ton of like footnotes. There are like stories in there themselves. Mm-hmm. It at times makes me like really frustrated, mm-hmm. but I think that's kind of the point of it. Is like you're supposed to be in this constant state of like highs and lows and ebbs and flows with it because mm-hmm. the main character you kind of get the sense is like slowly losing his mind as he goes oh, through this, okay. and I think you're supposed to be like kind of experiencing that. So there are times when I'm just like too much ebb i need to walk away now <laughs> need more flow yeah exactly I can see why this would not necessarily be someone's first choice for audio it is it would be impossible for audio yeah, yeah. i mean the copy i have actually is a really nice um i guess it's like kind of like an anniversary edition and they did like a lot of color photographs and stuff in there and mm-hmm. it looks really cool it's very hefty it's very complicated okay so I'm question down. is this in your sort of like realm of multimedia books that you're kind of started to enjoy oh it's absolutely yeah. falls into that yeah i mean like it's it's As not a janice you know. hallett epistolary novel for sure it's yeah. like it's it is hard to describe i've heard people say it's like it's hard to describe and it just is because it's kind of like a gigantic mess of a book mm-hmm. intentionally like it's right. supposed to give you that kind of creepy overwhelmed mm-hmm. vibe by doing that right um but I'm sure it like no one's even bothered trying to make this into an audiobook. Partly yeah. because a lot of it is visual, mm. like the like way that like there's spacing in some pages are like missing pieces and stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. all kind of like part of the experience. The experience. Or like you mm-hmm. have pages where things are crossed out, you know, mm-hmm. and that's part of like why were those crossed out and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So, well, as okay, now I'm just like riffing and asking you all kinds of questions because you're a multimedia artist as Again. well. Yes. As a writer, would you ever take on the challenge of writing a book that's sort of multimedia like this? I have not. So far, I have not been, like, reading it. Because I've read, obviously, a lot of, like, epistolary type things and, you know, that sort of thing this last year. I know year. you've worked in, like, screenplay writing as well. Yeah, and stuff like that. And so far, I have not been inspired to be like, I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. But I am thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll And get I know you've dabbled in graphic novels and yeah, all kinds of different just, storytelling. Just, just put over. it all together. Just mash it. Mash it, yeah. I mean, this... House of Leaves, I think, would be called a very good description of just mashed together. <laughs> yeah. There are literally some pages where, like, the top of the page is one story and the bottom of the page is this, another story. Uh-huh. And, like, you read them, like, side by side. Oh. You have to... There, well, I have multiple bookmarks because sometimes you're, like, flipping to the back of the book to read an entire chapter and then to the front of the book to finish uh-huh. the chapter. And yeah. It's, yeah. It's an experience. And I am, I am not putting any, like, constraints on myself of this one. Like, yeah. when I get there, I will get there. <laughs> All right. Next question. All right. What was your favorite book from, or what is your favorite book from childhood? Uh, let's see. You know, the first book I remember, like, really making me enjoy reading and, like, get into reading. Yeah. Um, I think I'll probably list as, like, my favorite book just because it's, like, the experience it so, of it. Yeah. Yeah, important. Um, it was called Midnight in the Dollhouse. As an adult, looking back on this book, I am aware that there are some very problematic things in this book. Yeah. So I'm not being like, go send your kids out to read this This isn't a recommendation. No. This is a description of your experience. Exactly. My parents were not the type of parents that like read books before I read them. They Mm -hmm. trusted the school and this was at a scholastic bookstore. Yeah. Um, One of those events. Book fair. Oh God. Those things were the best thing in the world. I know. But um, it's... It's like a child's gothic novel. So, yeah. like, you know, apparently I was like this as a child. I, I find <clears throat> it's really interesting to see how many of those threads, like, come through for, from my childhood, too. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, oh, yeah, I was very strongly born with a certain personality. personality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Midnight in the Dollhouse, it's the story of this girl who um, becomes injured and, like, a child mm-hmm. and spends several months be- bedridden. Yeah. So her family buys her a dollhouse and a set of dolls to play with while she's in bed. Um, but the dolls come to life at Ooh. night. <laughs> and it's just the first book I remember being, like, I started reading it on the way home and got so into it and, like, couldn't put it down. Yeah. That was the first time I really experienced that. And then, yeah. you know, it's like you never look back from that because you realize, like, oh, books can give me this experience. Yeah, <laughs> imagination unlocked. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, is, it is funny now looking back on an adult. As an adult, you're just like, that book is oh, kind of whack. <laughs> that's that's rude um okay so again not a book i recommend but i still hold it fondly and my heart is like that kind of the i that was really the first book where i'm just like oh i might be into reading yeah Yeah, a book like that for me was black beauty which i read when i was pretty young it was remember black beauty yeah so i think one i was always really into horses i was a horse i am a horse girl 
still am, I think. I think they're magnificent, elegant creatures, and I won't let anyone tell me any different. Okay? Who thinks different? (laughs) Who doesn't like horses? I don't know. People (laughs) might find them scary or goofy. They are, they can be goofy, but anyway. <laughs> and then if, I loved so many books about animals. Like if there was a dog companion or any kind of companion animal, like I always loved those books. And then of course I've liked classics. So, uh, like even when I was little, I'm yeah. like, oh, I was like picking sort of like this Victorian style chill child's classic. It's so funny when I like kind of think about who I am today and look back on it. It's, it's always there from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, and it like made me cry and I was oh, so yes. sad and I didn't really understand, you know, it, that it, she was trying to write a book about animal cruelty. I was just like, what are you doing to my heart? Yeah. <laughs> Not ginger, you know? <laughs> that is also one of the books I remember, like my, my siblings went out and played for the Saturday and I had started reading this and I was just like, go, yeah, leave. go play. I'm just doing this. Yeah. This is what I'm doing today. I must find out the fate. <laughs> beauty it was it's a very distressing book i don't necessarily re- like i i guess i recommend it i obviously survived my childhood <laughs> a good message don't be mean to animals so i mean you know. yeah it's probably a message that all of us need to learn at that age so yeah. by all means that's a, i would say that's far safer to rec- knowing what it is it yeah. is a sad story safer to recommend it than, than night in the dollhouse there you go so um more recently than Night at the Dollhouse, a book that kept you up at night. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, honestly, probably the most recent book that I stayed up like way too late reading, interesting, was I reread Dune. Oh, yeah. And even though it was like a reread, I was still like, 10 more minutes. Yeah. One more chapter. I just need to finish this chapter <laughs> and then I'll go. And it's like, yeah, this is why I like yeah. this book because. I doesn't, it doesn't matter that I've been here before. I can just yeah. go back and just stay up. I don't read often at night, mm-hmm. so like that's not usually yeah. something that keeps me up. But yeah, that was definitely like, I'm like, I know what's going to happen. Yeah. I can go. To, nope, I can't go to bed. I need to just. I need Next to chapter. Just, I need to just look. Because like, <laughs> actually it was a scene where like I knew a character was going to die. And I'm like, I just, yeah. I need to do this. I need to, I need to face his death again. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, a couple years ago read, um, a couple years ago I read A Secret History and that was uh, unputdownable for me. I think I read it in two days and I put in hours and I just was like, I cannot stop reading this. I must find out what's happening here. So that was definitely a book that kept me reading for way too long, way too late. (laughs) That is scary stuff is happening. I mean, yeah, like. But it's like kind of one of those things where like, it's totally worth being tired tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Next one up. How do you pick the next book when you want to read? When you finish that one, the phone you're on, how do you, do you start, first of all, do you like go directly to another one or do you give yourself some time? No, I, I almost always like close, immediately. take a few notes, find its spot on the shelf, get very proud that I get to put it on my shelf, it's enjoy the moment of completion, update my little app, and then I'm right back in yeah right into my next one so let's see usually um i don't often read books in a series like all together i for whatever reason i'm very much a mood reader i do like variety so sometimes it's like i kind of just want to switch up what i'm reading to maybe a different genre or different style or something Mm -hmm. like that um i have a small tbr physical tbr at my house so then it's like typically i want to pick off of that but also like i always have like books sort of in the queue on hold. I don't know if you do this where I like, I have it on hold and then I'm like update hold for seven days, for seven days, oh, for yeah. seven days until it's like, yeah. oh, it comes in when I'm not in the middle of reading a book. Oh yeah, exactly. So yeah. if something is like coming in, then I'll usually try that. And that's usually how I read most of my audiobooks. So, but um, the books that I get from the library are books that I'm sort of like less, like they're not a hundred percent for me. So I tend to go through those quite quickly. If Just it's like, there. it doesn't fit, then I'm like, oh, cause I, I know quite quickly if a book is for me or not. So it's like, oh, I've listened to the first five minutes and this ain't it. And then I'm returning it and getting the next one. So it's sort of like, I don't know. I don't know what to say except for that I have like this treadmill of books that are You've sort of You've kind of got there. like a cloud. A cloud. And, and I'm out. pulling out between what's available and what sounds good. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah it must be at, the, at, at my fingertips. Exactly. Ready to go. Lined up in the wings. Yeah. I concur. I concur. I'm very similar in terms of like, I usually am pretty quick to start another book. Yeah. 
Um, cause I just like to have a book on in the background when I do certain things like going for walks or, you know, stuff like that. Like I just yeah. like to have a book available. I don't want to waste time. Like, you know, trying yeah. to figure out what to read. I usually will read like, uh, if I like a book, I'll read like several books from that author. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll kind of go through like a phase of reading this author or if I like a genre, I'll read like, sometimes I'll read like 20 books from that genre and then mm-hmm. I'll switch and do a different genre and do 20 books from that genre. This <laughs> is the power of audiobooks, people. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have like in my like notion set up like certain authors that I'm working through and mm-hmm. I just have like all the books that I know I want to read from them and yeah. so I can go in and be like I mean so I did with Anne Rice today like I'm like okay I'm in I'm in the mood for some Anne Rice so I went to my Anne Rice page and I picked out a series and it was available uh immediately on the library which those are always good days when you go on it's like borrow mm-hmm. now and I'm like why Fantastic. yes I will <laughs> so yeah I usually have like I have a list of books that I know I want to read and then I have a list of books that like if we're at the bookstore and I find something that's interesting, I'll just write it down so I can mm-hmm. go. If I want to, feeling like something entirely new, I have an right. entire list organized by genre. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to be like, what genre do we feel like today? <laughs> yeah. I just imported a bunch of books into my notion that I had sort of like saved in other lists that I knew I wanted to read at some point mm-hmm. so that I could have it all in one spot. And it's good to have that place to turn to where you're like, oh, what's next? whether it's your physical TBR or a list of authors or a list of books that people have recommended to you or whatever. So you can just like be like, because I think both of us are very much mood readers. Oh yeah. Like I need to be, there's just like, especially, I mean, for me, even like seasons are a thing. Like, Mm -hmm. like during the summer, I'm not really reading a lot of like creepy Gothic novels because it's just not right. (laughs) But October hits. Yeah. (laughs) You're just like, so yeah, like I want to like kind of be like, Oh, this sounds like a really good novel for October. So I yeah. put it on the list and then October I'm feeling it and go there. That's there's, right. Okay. There's something like when it gets like a little bit dark and rainy, like I immediately need to start that season with a book that takes place in London. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't care what book it just needs to be in London yeah. and then we can start this. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. All right. Next. Up. All right. What's the book you read the most times and how many times have you read it? Um, probably Pride and Prejudice. I've read it pr- six or seven times. I feel like which is maybe not that much. I don't know, but it's one that like, I, even though it's not my favorite, Austin, it's really good. (laughs) Um, and I've had to read it for school a couple of times and I just really like it. And sometimes you're just in the mood for Elizabeth and Darcy, you know? Yeah. And I just want to see their story again. They are a mood. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's one. What about you? Um, I'm probably at this place. It's going to be Murder in Mesopotamia by Agatha mm. Christie. Yeah. I often, I read that annually for like five years in a row. Yeah. Um, cause it's just like, that's one of my absolute favorite of Christie's. Obviously I've mm-hmm. read it that many times. Right. Um, but it like has all of the right, like mm-hmm. thing. it takes place obviously in Mesopotamia, but it's got, you know, it's so, it's just the vibe of it. Mm-hmm. You know, the archeological dig is so fascinating. Mm-hmm. I love that atmosphere. I love, it's like the perfect use of Poirot in there. It's not too mm-hmm. much. It's not too little. I love the narrator. She's so yeah. funny. She's so, she's so English in all the yeah. right ways. You know, it's just kind of a very like all the right flavors mixed into one book. So mm-hmm. it's kind of my comfort read when I feel yeah. like when I'm kind of in a rut and I don't really know what to read. I turn on Murder in Mesopotamia and then yeah. like, it's kind of like a reset. Yeah. All right. Um, what is your current favorite book? What's tops right now for you? Tops is definitely a fan of the opera and it probably always will be. Yeah. Um, Dune is in second place, which is kind of, that's, I, I kind of, we were, my husband and I were going, cause we like to do like once a year, we're like, okay, what's, what's your favorite book set? Because yeah. my husband has roughly 15 of his top five books, yeah. which I like me. I'm like, what's on your top five list? Is it 15 or is it 20 by now? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I put Dune on there this year and he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I, I think we need to put Dune in like second space right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I interestingly have like, so on my, my top favorite books, I have, um, Jane Eyre and Mansfield Park. Mm -hmm. And I told them like, I officially decided I'm never going to read those again Mm -hmm. because I read them when I was a different reader Mm -hmm. and I don't want to like go back and ruin that space for me. I'm just like, I'm really, really happy with my memories of those. Mm -hmm. And I just like want for at least at this stage in my life, I want to leave those memories where they are and just be like, it was okay that I was a different reader at those times. I really enjoyed those books where they are. Yeah. I was actually recently reflecting on Jane Eyre because I I had done a video a few months ago comparing Jane Eyre's role in her book and Miss Marple as a character and her role in the way that mm-hmm. they can kind of like 
they get access to these private spaces, which allows them to surveil what's going on, which means right. that they can kind of figure out the mystery. So whether it's Gothic or a traditional mystery, they're kind of these observant characters. Right. And I was realizing that like, well, part of the reason why the, and because they also hold this space of being like unmarried women. So a spinster, a governess, and you know, our traditionalist culture doesn't really like that, especially f- for Jane and Jane Eyre's Eyre's time, time. yeah, you know, and so it's sort of like wanting to get these women kind of into the nuclear family and kind of settled into that. It's a little bit find a way to make it right, right? Exactly concerned, yeah, yeah, and so and then like Marple is kind of operating in this post-war era where it's like there's a lot of unmarried women and she's you know continuing to she obviously never got married before the war and after the war. Anyway, um, so, and then I was thinking, you know, I actually kind of need to update my views on Jane Eyre because I always really viewed her as this sort of like strong female character who didn't use her beauty for her power. She wasn't, right. you know, you know, this sex object. Um, and she had a lot of autonomy and blah, blah, blah. But actually I'm sort of seeing the way in which these roles are sort of reinforcing conservative values because they're basically surveillers and mm-hmm. they're finding out that things are wrong. And especially like Jane Eyre, it's like, we got to deal with the racism of Bertha <laughs> like, and like the uh, yeah. bad wife, like being crazy up in the attic. And here's the young, pure English, you know, Rose coming mm. in. Who's like the desirable wife for you to have. And, you know, anyway, I, I was like, Oh, I think I need to update some of the criticism I have around this book because I've never really engaged with it. Cause I read it when I was like, 16 and I was just like I'm a wallflower too (laughs) (laughs) yeah there are books where I'm like I should be examined and there are books where I'm just like much like Midnight in the Dalt House I'm like you know what it occupied a certain space in my life and I'm totally okay with that and I can be a different reader now while also being like you know what I love that what it meant a lot to me for the person I was Mm -hmm. at the time I read it and I'm just gonna hold that (laughs) yeah yeah have you ever met a writer in real life let's see um, well, actually, so my er, one of my earliest friends, her father is a prof- very well-known professional writer. So I grew up like oh, there you go. hanging out with them, you know, having cheese toasties at their house. And then like as I got older, I was like, wow, you are actually quite famous and award-winning. And <laughs> when I was six, I did not get that. <laughs> I did not appreciate that at yeah. six, but that's fine. I had cheese toast. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, it was funny because like... And for my birthday for years, they would just give me, you know, but among other things, but always a notebook and a pen. Nice. And I was like, now I understand I <laughs> the writer influence, which I loved. And I always wrote stories and stuff like that when I was a kid. So it was a gift also for me as a person. Yeah. Nice. What about you? I mean, I've... You know yourself. I know you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, I've hung out with a lot of like self-published authors, mm-hmm. you know, and that sort of thing. I've never met someone who would be considered a well-known author. Mm-hmm. Also, a lot of my favorite authors are dead. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> Is there a particular author that you would want to meet in real life? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> there are some, like, authors, like, contemporary authors that I read that um, are self-published authors who have actually become quite successful, and I would kind of, like, enjoy sitting down and just like talking to them about their process because they don't talk a lot about their process online right. you know they're just promoting their books which is totally mm-hmm. fine tell me what that book is coming out next yeah. that's totally cool with me but yeah. I would be interested to know like like actually as like from a perspective of every writer I'd like to hear you talk more about your writing process you know right but a lot of their readers are just there for the books so I get why yeah. they don't do a lot of like writer specific content yeah for me, it's probably Anne Patchett. I started reading her books and really fa- fell in love with her books. And then I recently read um, a book of personal essays from her. And I just got to really like her as a person through those stories. Mm. And then I also follow her on TikTok. And I like her TikTok content. And I'm like, I kind of, I have this sort of like adopt me feelings. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I really like you. And I wish we were like real life friends or whatever. <laughs> Which is called being a fan. <laughs> <laughs> the way well, um, nothing wrong yeah there are there are, every once in a while there's like public figures that i like have that feeling towards like ina garten i've told you oh about. Yeah, like yeah. i always i'm like adopt me and be my mom <laughs> <laughs> like i just really like you i don't know why i don't i don't know you but as far as i can tell i really like you so you make good food yeah. <laughs> and ann patchett she sort of occupies a similar space for me in my 
like emotional reaction to her. Is this the author that was recently like had multiple books banned in Florida? And yes, she, she did. did. I love. Okay, I liked her content that yeah. she put. That's the first time I saw her on social media, yeah. and I really liked the way she addressed that situation. Yeah. I was like, well done. I know. <laughs> she isn't. She, she's just kind of great. I'm like, oh, I like you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What yeah. book do you think nobody should die without reading? If I could put it in, I actually made a TikTok about this recently. So yeah, serious. This, we're gonna get get into spicy we're, Alexandra. We're gonna bring it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, there is a really large booktuber and book talker named Jack, and I follow him. And he recently posted about um, White Nights by Dostoevsky. No. Yes, by Dostoevsky, and he was like, oh, I found this place online that was pulling all of these quotes and was kind of like casting this book as like this extremely tragic romantic story. And he read it, and it's a short story, it's one of his short stories, and he was like, it's so romantic, it's so tragic. And I was like, no! <laughs> I is... did see this, I saw this video. <laughs> and so there is a book which I actually brought for one of our like book exchanges as well because I wish I could just get it into the hands of everyone. I feel like it's so culturally important. And it has White Knights in it, among other um, short stories by Dostoevsky that are all dealing with this issue, which is the problem of idealizing the female when you're a man in mm. like Western culture and the way, it's basically like a letter to incels <laughs> everywhere. Or like if you're a red pillar, a bit if, of a problem with if that. you, yeah, if you <laughs> like are into, you know, online dating coaches, anything like pickup artist stuff, Anything that kind of exists in that manosphere, if you will. Right. Um, th this is a really great and beautifully insightful set of stories that I think gives the insight into the danger of adopting that worldview. And it's one where your ego becomes extremely fragile. You continue to protect it through isolation. Mm. You idealize the other so that you never actually have to have a real relationship with someone. And then you continue to blame them for your loneliness in this world as you become increasingly isolated as you kind of spiral. Right. And so for one of the characters in a different story, he like just goes completely mad at the end of it. And like he has hallucinations and he becomes paranoid and like everyone in his life he begins to suspect and all of this sort of thing. And it's phenomenally well written. And White Knights is the most traditionally romantic. So if you read it in isolation, I could see why you might think that it's an endorsement of mm. tragic romance. But, it's more meant to be like but it's a, a high, But it's also highly critical. And if you're reading it and you're paying attention, you should see the ways in which he's highly critical of it because they don't get together. They, he, he never, the main, I feel like I'm giving spoilers, but also it's an old book. We, there's kind of a rule if it's over like a hundred years old, like stop expecting us not to spoil it. Yeah. <laughs> but like, and you know, he, and he's nibble, never able to really successfully engage in a relationship with her or with anyone else because of his idealism. And it's that same problem, but it's more extremely illustrated in some of the other books. So Jack, stop saying that it's romantic. It's not, it's the opposite of it. And it's, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, not only are, do I disagree, like, I'm, I don't often say this, but you are wrong. That is not a correct interpretation. That's not what the point of this book is. And it's kind of the yeah. opposite of that. It is not glorifying this. It is critiquing it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one that I... <laughs> <write it. laughs> what, what's a book that you would, like, shove into someone's hands if you could? Uh, that would be um, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, for yeah. sure. Um, which might seem kind of like a cliche pick, but that's because you should read it. So, yeah. like, sorry that that's cliche. <laughs> you should just do it. That's very. It's a very short book. The first half is kind of Viktor Frankl's telling his own experience as a survivor of the Holocaust, which I feel like is really important. Growing up in the culture that I grew up in, there was a very strong tendency to not hear the voices of actual Jewish victims mm -hmm. of the Holocaust, but to tell the stories from the perspective of people who saved Jews. Yeah. And so I think it's very important, first of all, for Jewish people to tell their own story from mm -hmm. their own perspective and not yeah. be like, you know, here's this Dutch family who can tell it for you. Like, no, yeah. like we need to be actually hearing their voices. Mm -hmm. Like his experience is obviously pretty horrific. But then the second half of the book is like kind of the philosophy he developed as the way he survived that. Mm -hmm. His way of like coping with it is incredible and beautiful. And you know, like he, he is the only one in his family that survives. Like it's not yeah. like, you know, and happily ever after I survived and we read now like he lost his wife, his entire family. And, but then ended up becoming like a, um, basically a therapist to other survivors. Mm -hmm. And, and so he kind of walks through the process of like why he feels like he survived 
and like the process of like helping other people like move past that and continue on with their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like an ideology that's honestly applicable to any of us who, Mm -hmm. you know, get bogged down in like everyday life, you know, like his whole philosophy is searching for like, you know, purpose, like Mm -hmm. that humans need a sense of purpose, whether that's like a grand purpose or just like, you know, my purpose might be very small, but it's still a purpose Mm -hmm. and it's still meaningful to me. And that's still important. I mean, like, honestly, like post like world war two, he's already writing about like the dangers of AI in Mm -hmm. essence, like, and like letting the technology in the world, like take away humans, like basic need for their purpose, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful book. It's a very quick read. Like it's not a commitment Mm -hmm. at all, but I feel like that's an incredible level of like content to put into just such a short you yeah. know, book. It's really beautiful and everybody should read it. And I've read it multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. What book do you think is most overrated? That's a tough one because I think a lot of books are most offensively so. overrated. Most books are. <laughs> most books are. <laughs> Almost all books that are popular. No, we're such like contrarians. I know neither of us t- really do the popular book thing. Yeah, so. neither of us really like. It, it, more and more, if a book is becoming popular, it's a clue to me that I probably won't like it. Right? Yeah. Like there, everyone. With few exceptions, and exceptions. I'm usually surprised, and I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah. I can, and and I think you know naturally there are feelings of FOMO where it's like, well. I feel bad being a cranky cranker, you <laughs> yeah, know, who's yeah. just, like, I'm not trying to rain on your parade, but why do y'all have bad taste? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's entire genres where I'm just like, I keep trying <laughs> and I have yet to figure out why you're into this. I mean, if you're into it, it's fine, but like, it's not can, for me. Why can we me. stop acting like shocked when I'm like, no, I mean, Okay, I'm just going to say it, and everyone can get angry with me. I think YA is overrated. <laughs> you know what? Let's land there, because there's so many that just, like, fit, and that's a really good answer, because I, I obviously very strongly agree. And we've talked to, have we talked about it before on the channel? But it's like, why can't we offer high-quality books to a younger audience? Yeah. I, like, why does it mean that it's, it's lower-quality writing just yeah. because it's for a younger reader? And it always makes me think, like, oh, it's because you're talking down to your audience. Right. For, on some level, you think they don't deserve a high-quality book or an intelligent book or a compelling story or an interesting story that's not just cliches. And, like, don't get me wrong, I think, as we've discussed about in the past, like, there's always room for fluffy books and f- books that Enjoy- are just for, for fun. enjoyable, yeah seems to me that it's not like a 50 50 split it's like a 95 5 split yeah on the compelling and interesting and deep and you know well written and well constructed you know versus the more you know slapdash or just for entertainment purposes type of books so yeah it's i'm ready for us to take YA seriously right well and to acknowledge that like like there's this kind of like set stamp of like all teenagers blah 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 and it's like Um, okay. First of all, the concept of teenager is like kind of a newer concept. And so when you're writing like a lot of like historical or like, you know, fantasy that we're young adult fantasy that takes place clearly in a historical setting Mm -hmm. and you're writing like 16 year olds, like being Mm -hmm. whiny about like, it's like, you're not even like understanding the concept of a teenager to start with, you know, but also like not all teenagers are the same. And we, we write young adult characters as if they all feel the same thing. And I think that's kind of rude. Yeah. I think it's real rude. (laughs) I think all of it ties into this fact that I feel like the audience is being disrespected. Yeah. Concur. And that's just no good. And I don't, then I don't get like why, like we're like 40 year old women who are like into that. I don't, I don't get it. I'm sorry. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I think, you know, and this is kind of like where I've landed that plane is that I think that there's an audience of, Well, I think, okay, here's what I, I think we have a cascade of problems. Okay. We have an audience who grew up reading YA, who continues to read YA, but now they've aged out of it, but they haven't really acknowledged that what they're looking for, they should be looking for somewhere else. Yeah. We also have in this sort of like post uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, a real high level of eroticism and romance Mm -hmm. where you're moving much closer to erotic novels rather than just romance, which like there's a huge degree of difference difference, between the explicitness of the content and how much of that content, like the sex content is part of the book. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen the romance genre really get pushed much closer to what used to be called erotic. And so then you're having adult women who are looking for basically 
what should be adult romance, romance, but it's being stretched in this direction and they're sort of pulling YA along it, with them along with them to yeah. have more adult related content, which is totally fine, you know, when you're not 14 and appropriate for you to enjoy and have fun with. Well, yeah. And like my discomfort in that is like, like, okay, like I don't see any problem with there being like adult content in adult books, but right. when we start like bringing the young adult in there, like that's, that's not okay. Like, like yeah. they, and there it, are things that shouldn't be in young adult fiction because right. young adult fiction, regardless of how many 30 and 40 years of it is still read by young adults. And there is mm-hmm. a certain level where we should be and like, of, this is a boundary. Right. And of course there's always like, and it, <clears throat> like there's no reason why you shouldn't necessarily have any sexual content for teens. Right. But when you have sexual content that has the intent to titillate. Right. That's, there's a difference there. There's a difference there versus you know, normal teenagers exploring their lives and exploring yeah. their sexual natures. You're they're not like hiding it for them, but there is a difference between adult romance. Yeah. Content. And then there's like a complication for me where it's like, oh, if you're 35, 40 years old, reading a book that's intended to titillate, but the performers of the titillation are children. Yeah. Like then why? I'm like, that's a moral line. I don't want to no. be mm. like, I don't want to be like, oh, let's watch these teens like bump, you know? And you're just like, Mm, no I no (laughs) for so many reasons so anyway that's kind of like some of the problems with YA and what it's doing in our broader public publishing world and it's overrated (laughs) and it's overrated (laughs) there you go okay what is your favorite we're not this is no news to anybody favorite reading format audiobook for sure Yeah. yeah I mean I love physical books obviously Mm -hmm. but in terms of just like being able to continue to read and like read whenever I want to I just I love audiobooks yeah Um, I read was it I read 65 books last year and six were physical books (laughs) and one was an (laughs) ebook and the rest were audiobooks there you go yeah and I mean like audiobooks are so I so like there was a time when audiobooks were bad. Like mm-hmm. my my mom used to like every once in a while get them from the library when we were kids. Fourteen tapes. Of yeah, like this entire book of CDs that you're putting in, and we and they were so bad. <laughs> the phone case. <laughs> yeah. Pop. Yeah. There's like six cassettes. Exactly. <laughs> and it's like you can't buy them because it's like a hundred dollars for this. <laughs> right. so you have to wait. To the, and and every time I'd just be like, Why are we doing this? This is yeah. so bad. So if, like for a long time I didn't read audiobooks because like that was my experience mm-hmm. with it. But and now we have MP3s. There, well, there's that. You don't have to like lug around a bunch of CDs for one thing. <laughs> Could um, you imagine if you had like a boombox era? But it's just <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> okay, now I need to do this. <laughs> um, a but, romance novel. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Walking around with my dog in the neighborhood. Yeah. This is awkward for all of us, but it's happening. Hey, you know what? There is a couple in my neighborhood that were sitting out front with the projector watching a movie the other night. So, like, what's the difference, really? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I feel like audiobooks quality-wise have gotten quite good. I mean, like... Yeah. Like it doesn't, it's not something that's only for like extremely mm-hmm. high level published authors now. Like yeah. it's, it's pretty wide range of very good, good quality. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to access. I have many bio library apps at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. I have to say, I really, really love audiobooks. Yeah. The Midwitch Cuckoos, which I'm listening to on audio. I mean, it's not like a super huge title or anything, but they have a fully adapted, full cast Wow. Like screenplay f- intended for like an audio performance. Nice. And I'm like having a good time. It's great. I will say I, lo- and, I do like it when they get multiple voice actors yeah. in. That's always fun. Yeah. And I recognize that one of the voice actors is like a really famous British actor um, whose name I can't think of right now. Oh, but I've gotten to the point now where I've read so many audiobooks, I totally recognize the audio reader. They're yeah. the readers now. And I'm just like, oh, if Mason Lloyd is reading, I'm here for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay. Bill Nighy is the main voice actor on this. I'm like, how, how'd you get him? It's becoming a thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's audiobooks. We all, we love them now. Yeah. Okay. How about you though? My favorite is physical. I always have a physical book going, finish one onto the next. next. I feel like I retain it the best. You know, I like annotating. I like, I like my quiet. It forces me to have like rest time and quiet time, which I'm not always the best at giving myself right. but because I enjoy reading so much it's easier for me to build that habit around reading mm-hmm. um, to give myself that pause. Um, but I mean, I write it, I read everything. I get eBooks and listen to uh, audio yeah. books is a, a very, I wouldn't say a close second, but eBooks, I 
don't read very often. I very rarely e-read. It's usually when I like can't get something on audio and I really yeah. want to read it, but I don't want to pay like sixteen dollars for a hard copy. I'm like, okay, well I'll pay the three dollars for the ebook and just see if this is worth it. You know, yeah. like I can't. It's like that middle zone of like I can't get it the way I want to, but I'm also not putting sixteen dollars down on it. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, but audiobooks are. Solid. solid and I like to have one going all the time for you know car trips or chores or walks Rocks, or things yeah. like that I, yeah. I do enjoy having always one one of each kind of going at the same time yep all right how late into a book do you realize it will be one that you recommend to others as well okay so I would <laughs> I am a heavy DNFer so a book has to be if it's good enough for me to read it's good enough for me to recommend mm. but I do try to be thoughtful about like who is this book for you know because yeah. like just because I like it doesn't mean that somebody else will so that's the standard for me to read it in the first place like so books that I read <laughs> Here's a book that actually was willing worth to finish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, and again, I feel like I know very quickly in the first few chapters whether or not this is going to be a book for me. Or, you know, sometimes I do DNF books and say like, oh, I'm going to put this back on my shelf to read for later. Like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell is a book like that where I was like, oh, I, I picked it up. I had kind of the wrong expectations for it's it. Wrong I, knew, time. I knew it was good, but that wasn't what I was looking for. So I put it to the side and I'm going to read it later when I'm in the mood for that one. Mm -hmm. Um so that's it. I don't really consider that a DNF. That's just like, oh, you go back on the TV. It wasn't the right place, the right yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it, it has to be, if it's good enough for me to read, it's good enough for me to recommend. Those are, those, there's not a difference there. All right. I don't DNF very often. It's very rare for me to DNF because I like to, if I, if I don't finish it, I can't write it down as read. And <laughs> I really like that feeling. So <laughs> I will often suffer through. Yeah. Um, Although I do have a lot of books that like, I'm like, I'm going to pause on this and come back to it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes, um, that, like live in limbo forever and you're probably not coming back to, is that what you mean? I'm not ready to say I'm not coming <laughs> back. Like, okay. <laughs> well, the chances are getting lower the longer it's been on there. Uh, Maybe. Okay. Gotcha. Maybe. Gotcha. But I'm not ready to say I'm not coming back. Okay. <laughs> um, we all tell ourselves what we need to tell ourselves. You know what? I, it's, it's, it's what I need. <laughs> Like 11 books uh, I'm in the middle of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for me to recommend a book, it has to be something that I really, really, really liked. Because um, I read a lot of books that I feel like, oh, I, I enjoy this, mm -hmm. you know, just as like a quick read and just for fun of it. Mm -hmm. Or this is in my extremely weird niche because mm -hmm. I like hardcore military history. Okay. But I don't know a lot of people who enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunately married to someone that does because otherwise I don't know what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to be like a really good book and something that I feel is a little more universal. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people would like this genre. Because mm -hmm. there's also some books that are like, like, this is a really great book, but this is also extremely niche, and I don't yeah. feel like a lot of people would be interested mm -hmm. in it. So, for me, like, this, like it has to kind of qualify those two things. Yeah. It has to be something that I feel like has a little bit more general appeal, mm -hmm. and I thought it was really good. I've recommended books that I've never read because I thought they were bad, but I knew who would like them. There you go. And I go, you know who this is a book for? <laughs> this is a book for my friend. Like, and it's, again, it's just, there's no judgment there. It was it's like, just, I know it's that not for me, me. Yeah. but I know who it's for. I know the reader for this, and I have a pretty good sense that they're going to like it. So, like, recommendations don't always have to do with quality. No, I mean, there are some people in my life that when they recommend a book to me, I'm just like... The fact that you like it means that, that I I'm won't. not going to like it. Because but... you don't know me very well, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> but thank you for sharing something you like. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay for you to just say, I really liked it for these reasons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Would you rather read a book with an unclear ending that makes you wonder what the author meant or one with a heartbreaking ending? Both. <laughs> okay. Both fall into your, your zone. I love both of like Like, that. this would you rather is like, can, what, can I have a book that has both? I love it. I love open-ended books, movies, whatever. I, I want to interpret it. I want to find the clues. Mm. I want to figure out what it means to me. I want to figure out what the possible meanings are. Leave it open-ended for me. Leave it a mystery. I don't like anything to be too didactic or too mm. preachy. If a book is too like, here's what the lesson is, you know, you're just like, Ugh. yeah. You know, I want to I don't dig want to be my taught teeth something by you. <laughs> into, yeah, exactly. I want to dig my teeth into the weirdness, into the mystery, into the vagaries of life. <laughs> and I do like a book that makes me cry. I 
I'm not necessarily the best crier or I haven't been out throughout my life. Therapy has really helped me with that, getting in touch with my emotions. And so I used to use sad media to help me cry. And it's been very, because everybody needs to release your emotions, <laughs> turns out. <laughs> and so I have always really loved heartbreaking books. And there have been times like, or again, to go back to like Black Beauty, where I'm like, I can feel that I need to cry, but I don't know how to let myself, let me read this tragic story of animals <laughs> suffering so I can just wallow in my sorrows. Um, so I like, I like books that make me emotional. I like stories that make me emotional. I would solidly choose the first, as we, as you know, and now we will all know, I do not enjoy sad. I do not enjoy crying. <laughs> Sometimes and I need to. like... <laughs> that's Casey. That's, yeah, that's my, 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 my furry roommate up there. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. She wants to be on the podcast. We've been waiting for the time that her show and audio like, this audibly make a first appearance. time yeah. she has. So that would be Casey if you can hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't enjoy crying and mm -hmm. I don't enjoy sad books. I'm fine with ambiguous. I'm fine with like, you can think this through. Um, you know what I don't like though mm. is authors who are like, Hey, here's two endings. You've been talking about this that's recently. No. Pet that, peeve. Coward. No. Coward. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. You're being a coward. You're unwilling to have readers be re mad at you because you chose the wrong thing. So no, yeah. that's one thing. I, that's that's not an ambiguous ending. That's just you not being willing to commit. Yeah. Ambiguous. You let the reader think about things, yeah. but you're still willing to commit to an ending, to an idea, to something that happens. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be my like absolute no. Like yeah. if, if a book is advertised as that, if the book, cause I've seen this on book covers, mm -hmm. I can advertise like two endings. I'm like, nope, yeah. you don't get my money or my time. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely not. And I, I, for me, okay. And especially someone like, again, I like interpreting what the book means. So an ambiguous ending gives me the opportunity to interpret two mm -hmm. endings means that I don't know what this book means it's, because yeah. the ending of a book. So let's say it's a romance, right? And we have, we're watching a couple, will they get together, won't they get together? Maybe the two endings is when they do, when they don't. Right. Maybe they have, you know, things that they're working through. Maybe there's toxic things that come up in their relationship. Whether they get together means so much about like what you're saying about the type of relationship that they had right. and right. how you're framing that. And like, maybe they get together and it's like tragic and it's a bad decision. And you're saying like, you shouldn't get together with a person where you have this type of internal conflict between the two, right. you know, whatever it may be, but you have to put a pin on it for me to be able to know how to, the lens through which to view everything that happened right. be, uh, before that in a book. So that's why I hate it. it. The thing is like, as an author, if you write a book, you're probably going to make someone mad. Because yeah. you cannot write a book that's for everyone. Yeah. Like, end of story. End Sorry, of story. Sorry, you yeah. can't do that. So just write the book you want to yeah. write, commit to it. And if someone makes you, it's like someone's mad. I mean, okay, we do have issues with readers like threatening the lives of writers. That's not that's okay. Bad but reader behavior. behavior. That's yeah, we're not different. saying that. But like, you're not yeah. going to make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. So just choose who your reader is and write the book you intended yeah. to read. I right. mean, I make weird paintings. I know they're not for everyone. Yeah. That's my prerogative as an artist to self-express. Yeah. But I don't also get to have the prerogative of saying you must also like it. Right, right. Like that's people, not nobody, that's not what how the world works <laughs> no that's not how art works like, yeah you're, you're not making art for everyone because that's like literally impossible yeah so. it's like me as a person isn't for everyone there are people who dislike me yeah and who are like mm, not my favorite person i don't want to hang out with her and be friends with her i don't know why but yeah. <laughs> turns out yeah weirdly enough <laughs> so anyway that's right. a rant on that that would be we put that one to bed. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have strong feelings. Strong feelings, but that's important. Yeah. All right. Would you rather read the same genre forever or only be allowed to read one book from every genre? That's actually a difficult question for me to answer. I would say the same thing for me. Can I just circle back around when I'm done taking a tour of the genres? Yeah, like, like well, there, there's not... Because I want to write, a, obviously, a vast quantity of books throughout my life. I know, like, there's not enough genres for the one book to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, I would prefer variety... Same. ...to being stuck in... Like, I don't really have... I mean, other than, like... I have a few genres that I prefer over others, but, like, mm -hmm. I'm always open to trying something new, new and yeah. I always like to circle around all the different genres and come back to classics at home base and then go out and do some weird sci-fi and, yep. you know, et cetera, et cetera, circle back around. Um, 
so fundamentally what this question is getting at, I want the variety rather than reading. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. As someone who will like sit and read, like I have had one year where I read like 50 books in one genre, Mm -hmm. but then I like didn't read that genre for a year and read a bunch of other ones. Like you like as much as you like one genre, like I don't ever think you should stay in that genre. Mm -hmm. Like you should, because I feel like you're missing out if Mm -hmm. you don't try out all the different genres, you know? I agree. And there might be some genres that just aren't for you and that's okay, but that doesn't mean there's only one genre for you. Yeah. And I have to plug you again, because one year you made a reading journal that was designed for you to have Mm -hmm. like all the different genres and build lists so that you can kind of tour. Yeah. We both want variety. Yeah. Because I feel like personally, since I committed to like diversifying, I've enjoyed reading more. I yeah. just have. Yeah, 100%. I don't enjoy having that stale feeling. Yeah, exactly. So those are our rapid fire, which we spend a lot of time on each question, so maybe not the rapid fire. Rapid-ish. <laughs> <laughs> we have things to say, people. That's why we have a podcast. There's, there's we have no, opinions. There's nothing that we just like don't feel about. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that is true. So thank you so much for joining thank us you. for this episode. And... We'd yeah. actually love to hear, you know, your thoughts on this. Maybe yeah. we'll throw these questions up on the Discord and hear what other people have to say. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fun. We'd yeah. love to know what your favorite books or childhood books or thoughts on yeah. a format. The are. most important question, and it has one correct answer, is do you agree that an author is a coward <laughs> <laughs> if they put multiple me- endings at the end of their book? Maybe don't let us know if you disagree. <laughs> yeah. And as always, you can find us everywhere on uh, Spotify, on Google, on Apple. Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. And on YouTube. So we subscribe, come back. We'll have more episodes for you. Thank Sounds you so good. much. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.